as many as possible. All right, thank you for seeing the Monday report live from the Sarova White Sands in County 001, that is Mombasa. We're talking about safety at work, and it's turning out that most people do not even know what their rights are at work. And they leave alone how to claim when in wait of an injury. Keep your views coming at Trevor Media at Citizen TV. Can you use the hashtag Monday report? Let's start off from you, madam. Start with your, your name and comment or question. Thank you, Trevor, for the opportunity. I am Dr. Angeline Kirui. I'm a member of the National Council of Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, I commend the department for implementing the act as it is, despite the challenges in terms of resources. However, there's still a lot to be done. Um, the, employ the employee is the driver of occupational safety and health. Okay. But it comes out very clearly that that employee with the fulcrum is not informed, is not quite aware of their rights when it comes to occupational health and safety. Uh, my question goes to Daphne. How will the labor unions help to drive the occupational safety and health awareness? Uh, civic education in this country is at another level today and uh, the city century are able to take on their political leaders to demand for their rights. Okay. In the same way, we need to move occupational health and it is through the employee. We want to see the labor unions take this okay. to a greater level. How right. are you going to ensure that happens? All right, Daphne, the direct question to you before we get to the next question. Thank Go you ahead. very much. I appreciate you for that question. Yes, I want to con uh, appreciate what Dr. Nyanduzi said, that uh, matters occupational safety and health should actually be shared responsibility. And uh, working alone may not really sustain, may not bear, because you know, trade unions are not running the business. We go to such places, you know, the workplaces where in fight. What I think is going to help as much as we are running uh, educative sessions, we conduct trainings at the workplace. My appeal would be that if the employers and the Department of Occupational Safety and Health would come out in support, because sometimes we may read the law, yeah. But we are not the experts. Okay. I would wish if the Department of Occupational Safety and Health would be so free and willing that such that when we require, you know, their participation, for them to be able also to sensitize the working fraternity, that would really help us. And then the other thing I would appreciate, uh, my colleague from FKA said that they, they sensitize employers. Can this be also worker inclusive. Is there a way that we as social partners can come up together so that at least we achieve the goal? Because what is it that we are looking for? We are looking for a safe and healthy environment. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, the, the three partners working together would yeah. give us uh, a real good result. Okay. But over and above, yeah. We as workers continue to sensitize our membership. Yeah. Any support is highly welcome. Okay. Dr. Nyadusi, how much are you leveraging on partnership? Um, thank you, Trevor. We, we are really large on partnerships. Um, like I mentioned before, um, most decisions in labor are made on, on, on the basis of tripartism. Tripartism means government, workers, and employers. And that's the way it is locally, and that's the way it is even internationally. Um, we, we've just been introduced to, the, to, to one of the members of the National Council of Occupational Safety and Health, yeah. uh, Dr. Angeline uh, uh, Chepchirchi. And I would like to also recognize that the chairman of the National Council is here, and the other member of uh, Mr. Mr. Joseph Kangushu is here, and uh, the other member representing the National Council for Science and Technology is also here. So the National Council is a council that is charged with the responsibility to actually advise the Cabinet Secretary on matters of occupational safety and health. And this council draws heavily both from private sector and public sector, and, uh, and uh, as well as uh, seasoned um, 
uh, in independent members. So you will find that it has membership from the, 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 the Environment Management Authority, membership from the government chemists, members from universities, members from uh, the national uh, public labs, NACOSTI, um, FKE, KOTU, or yeah. we like saying the most representative worker organization and the most representative employer organization. Yeah. We have academia, we have the insurance agency. So we really do have a rich mix from which we can tap from and which creates a setting for, for collaboration. And okay. a lot of times when we are conducting our activities, it becomes easy for us to reach the safety and health message through um, the agencies that are represented in the in 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 in, 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 the, in the council. Okay. As well as that, we do have a lot of relationships with external agencies. Yeah. We are members of the International Commission for Occupational Health, and uh, really participate robustly in its programs. Yeah. As well as, of course, the International Labour Organization. Right. Most of our legislations are actually created in tandem with the International Labour Organization. Yeah. And. Uh, the, 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 the principles, what we call the conventions, the recommendations there of, of the international labor organizations form a large backbone to what, we, what, 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 what is in our legislation. So right. we also stand um, shoulder to shoulder with other nations in OSH. Okay. There's another question of concern over there. Yes, ma'am. Start with your name and then get to the question of comment. My name is Agnes Lubalo. Yeah. I'd like to direct my question to Dr. Musa Nyandusi. Yeah. You talked about shortage of officers, yet when we look in the country, we have graduates from Kenyatta University, we have students who have gone to the neighbors training, we have the DOSH itself who are providing courses on safety, we are also having other institutes that are providing safety courses. What are you doing to ensure that these people who are being educated are employed to be able to come in and to enforce and to support the DOSH so that we are having more officers, more trainers, more supervisors going outside there in the field to help the employers be able to ensure they implement safety requirements as far as OSH is concerned. Okay. Number two, I'd like to bring the issue of uh, the incident at Tika, the one of the boiler. I don't know what criteria you used to compensate somebody who is burnt beyond recognition and you award him only two million. I think there needs to be also a review on some of these incident cases. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the worst nightmare that anybody, any family can have is to actually have a loved one who is healthy and goes to a workplace and does not get out alive. Or even worse, gets out injured or disabled. I think it is an unfortunate event which um, the legislation in occupational safety and health and work injury benefits actually seeks to remedy. Um, the Work Injury Benefits Act is an act of parliament. It is signed into law by the president. And as a department, we are duty bound to implement the laws of the land as they have been passed by parliament. And the law of the land say, states that if you die, unfortunately, in the course of your employment, your compensation is your gross salary for 96 months. That is what the law says. That is eight years. So that's eight years. So if, for example, your salary is 21,000, it therefore means that your compensation is going to be close to what you stated. That is the law. If there is any changes that we would like to that law, I think we can only approach parliament and make the changes. But I, am, I hasten to mention that this period is actually benchmarked on all, practically all, all the countries as an ILO standard. But this is our country. If we feel it has to be, to be bigger and the case is made in parliament as a department, we are only 
going to be too willing to be able to do that. But we must operate within the confines of the law. No, I think it's important yes. to clarify that further because if the law says that if you're injured, you take your gross salary times 96. Yes. So if you're earning 21,000, your compensation, is, if you die, is 2,016,000. That is, the, that is the position legally. And being a legal institution, we are duty bound to act according to the law. Any action otherwise would be acting outside the law. So I know people have stated that it should be more, but it is what it is. Mule, what is your comment on that? Because what she's talking about is a case for Kale Botieno, who's a 34 year old man who died in a thicker factory. And there's a proposal to pay him two million, and the family was outraged by that. But Dr. Nyandwis is saying the law somehow ties their hands. It's your gross salary times 96 months. That's what the law says. Yes. Thank you. Those are the gaps that we are saying exist within the Work Injury Benefits Act, which actually needs to be looked into. Yes. Because some of the conversations, and unfortunately, I've seen some worse cases, not of course fatal, but of cases where somebody is totally you know, not able to resume work. But when you look at the conversation, and even looking at what perhaps, if there was a collective bargaining agreement, what that person would have earned, then those are two different things. Okay. So I think uh, th there is need to look at those gaps so that we also align with the current status as okay. it is. Yeah, you want to add something? Uh, I, I, I hear what my, my sister is saying. And uh, for those who may not know, the Work Injury Benefits Act, after, after its enactment in 2007 and it's coming to force in 2008, is one of the acts that has faced a lot of difficulty. It has faced a litany of litigation, and it's only in 2018 when finally the Supreme Court gave life to this act to allow it to be implemented. Um, in our course of implementing this act, there are certain observations we have made and uh, they form part of the thinking that currently the tripartite partners are pursuing. One of the thinking, in the, in the, I had stated earlier that the Work Injury Benefits Act is a blame-based act. The employer costs it, and therefore the employer must pay for it. And what happens is that as human beings, nobody quite likes being blamed. So what happens, everybody tries to show that the worker was working without instructions, you know, he was doing what he was not supposed to do, and at worst, sometimes, uh, one might even say he was not even my employer. So that there's a, there's a, there's a zone where now it doesn't, it's, it, there's no clarity about who this, who this person is. And we are thinking, if we can move to a setting where we can qualify, only qualify, the presence of occupational injury, the presence of an occupational disease, a disability from an occupational disease, a death from an occupational disease or injury, and qualify it, and have a setting on a social insurance basis for the compensation of this injury. We take away the blame and only qualify the fact that this person died as a result of an occupational disease and compensate him from a universal fund that is for occupational injuries and diseases. This fund will obviously have to be funded by employers. It's a conversation that is in the initial stages, it's a conversation that is ongoing. How much is going to be ap uh, appropriate? How is this fund going to be managed? What's going to be the responsibility? How much of this fund is going to go into administration? How much is going to go into occupational diseases? How much is going to go into research? and all those kind of things. Okay. But as a country, at the directorate, we feel that one of the ways that we can reduce industrial unrest and reduce the temperatures at work is to find a mechanism that does not seek to blame okay. and seeks to compensate the worker yeah. when he get, gets a disability in this setting. Okay. And the second thing, is that at the directorate, we also think that the, this compensation should not be in the form of a windfall. In the sense that this worker was earning, he was not earning two million shillings a month. He was not earning 20 million shillings a month. He was earning a prescribed amount of money per month. 
And if it is possible for the dependents to actually be getting a commensurate amount of money per month because it's supposed to compensate for the absence of this person and his inability to earn. Yeah. It is one of the things which we are pursuing, that we are engaging our social partners, and we hope we are going to find it as one of the critical ways that we are going to lower the temperatures and conflict at work and enable employers to focus on what they do as their core mandate and allow the compensation process to be less acrimonious. Are you suggesting a particular time frame for that compensation or do you suggest then that the company takes on the next of kin and give them almost the same the, level of training the, the, con the, job? The, the conversation, Trevor, is ongoing. And the thinking is this, and the thinking is based on what happens in, in, in other jurisdictions. In other jurisdictions, you have a fund into which employers contribute. And this fund is contributed according to risk. So that if you're, if, if you're found to be a highly risky workplace, of course your premiums are going to be a lot higher. Yeah. If you're found to be a, 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 an enterprise that has a lower risk, then your risk profile is lower. And over time, um, you, are, you, you, are, you are able to, 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 to pay less. Okay. But the thinking is that out of this fund, the, 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 the worker is put through the process of establishment that this was actually occupational yeah. and is paid without necessarily blaming the employer mm -hmm. or blaming the worker. Of course, the Occupational Safety and Health Act is still in place. Yeah. And being that the Occupational Safety and Health Act is still in place, it means that if there were serious issues of non-compliance with the, with, the, with the occupier, action can still be taken on this occupier if there were serious issues of non-compliance that led to some of the accidents that are going there. But it's one of the thinking, it is not something that has been uh, fully established, but yeah. we have had at, uh, meetings that have involved the tripartite partners. Yeah. We have involved our other, other government agencies, including the NHIF, NSSF, the National Treasury, TRA, the IRA, in this conversation. Okay. And uh, there, there are some preliminary reports that have been made, yeah. which are still in discussion. There are many steps still to go in terms of understanding what the actuarial meaning would be, yeah. what the actual amount is going to be. But uh, you may note that some of our neighbors are already implementing such a system, and it okay. leads to significant reductions of temperatures at work. Yeah. And we can be able to comfortably say that yeah. when a worker is injured, there's a social mechanism that is able to protect. Almost guaranteed. Obiro, would this be the, the ultimate solution before I come to the audience for more comments and questions? Uh, Trevor, we, we are open to the discussion of any reform that we need to make our, uh, the way we compensate or the way we take care of uh, the injuries and uh, all the safety issues. Yeah. come in place and this is one of the way that has been proposed which is still under discussion from the employer's perspective three things that we have to look at one what is the cost implication of it to the Kenyan uh, employer and this we want the government to look at it comprehensively of all the reforms we know from where we sit we have piecemeal introduction of different levies that are coming into play We've had the NHIF, we have the uh, NSSF uh, review, the act that is there, and so many other things that come into play. We want to see them in totality and see what is the implication of what is being proposed. Yeah. If you compare what we currently have and what is being proposed, what is the best option? Because we want to go with the best option, the option that is a win for the employer, a win for the worker, and a win for the government. If we can get that win-win option that doesn't make any of the player to be worse off than where we are, then that is an option that we should be uh, talking about. As, the, as a, um, the director has said, we need to see the actual evaluations so that then we can be able to see the feasibility of it and even the sustainability of it. And Kenya, there is another big challenge. We need to look at the governance issues we live in Kenya, there has been a lot of issues about the funds. Yeah. So how do we take care of the governance issues so that then this fund, if at all is uh, established, it will be able to just be utilized in the way we envision. And it doesn't become yeah. an avenue to get money from the employers and then we do with it our other things. Okay. That's, that's something we have to look at it. 
Yeah. Uh, Trevor, I want to talk about something that uh, my sister talked about and a question that came on the floor. Yes. It's very important as a country that as we talk of our rights, we should also talk of our obligation. We should not just talk about the rights we have without the obligation we have. And that's where we fail as a country. We are so much into the rights and we forget about what is our obligation in all these things. So can we also talk about, uh, instead of just talking about this is the right of the employer, this is the right of the employee, what is the obligation of the employee? What is the obligation of the employer? And what is the obligation of the government? Yeah. And so that we are, we, our conversation is, what are we doing to meet this obligation? Because once we meet the obligation, we shall see the other side of the equation being worked on well. All right. Thank you. Let me bring another question from the audience. I see there's a hand raised over there. I'll come back to, back to you, Dr. Thank you. Let's take that question, then I'll come to you at the back. Yeah, start with your name, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Iroko Maina, and I direct my question or concern to the lady from uh, Kepau. Uh, consider a um, smallholder farmer who has a small estate. He's a coffee farmer, for example. Uh, do, do you have uh, any program to take care of such, or do you consider them to be purely self-employed people? And then uh, to Dr. Musa Nyandusi. The definition of a, a workplace includes a vessel. In my understanding, a vessel could be an airplane or maybe a bus. Why haven't you brought on board uh, the buses, matatus, to be workplaces? Thank you so much. Okay, let's start with you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, when you talk about a worker and in the mind of uh, the Central Organization of Trade Unions Kenya, that worker is that somebody who serves for a pay, yeah, mm -hmm. or for compensation. So we know that anybody engaged for services, they need to understand their rights. And I appreciate what my brother said, the rights and responsibilities. So we have programs within the Central Organization of Trade Unions that we run across the country, which are very cheap and affordable, and that also caters for the issues of occupational safety and health. We have uh, issues to do. Uh, we, we have a manual that is uh, we call the you know the pattern kind of uh, which is actually study circle where we have trained numerous people, very many people in this country who are able to disseminate the same information. Sit down with those people, and we have leads in every uh, in every county. For instance, in Mombasa, I will talk of about 150 people already trained who can also disseminate that information to their fellow employees. And therefore, this is a program that does not stop. And that just doesn't also talk about uh, occupational safety and health alone, but it talks about anything around the world of work. Yeah. Uh, matters to do with employer-employee relations, industrial relations and all that. So yes, uh, that small person and that big person they are our people. All right. And they are the people we target to All ensure right. that they are fully informed. Dr. Nyanduzi, you wanted to make a comment before you address this issue around the bus. Um, I, 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 I just part. wanted to point out that there's a question the lady asked about employment, yeah. which I think we've lost over. And I was feeling a bit uh, like we didn't do her justice. Yeah. Um, it's true that uh, our staff complement is not as high as we would wish it to be. And it's also true that the workplaces, especially after we opened out the Occupational Safety and Health Act, more workplaces came into the administration of OSHA. Um, the investment in training in OSH is actually a realization that there's a huge need for persons with OSH in, 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 in this country, not necessarily in government. As you can see, starting from the workers' uh, representative, there are OSH people in there who train people when they are not bargaining, in a, doing a collective bargaining agreement. <laughs> From the employer side, there is training I know that takes place, and that also means that there are persons who are, who, who are involved in, in, in OSH as well. In all enterprises today, for you to be able to run OSH-related programs, it is inherent that you must have OSH knowledge. So yes, as government, we require as many people as possible to fill our staff complement. 
but there's a bigger service need for us to be to have persons with a background in OSH to be absorbed into the private enterprises for us to over time inculcate a culture inherent within the institution of safety and health. So I would encourage whoever is studying safety and health to be encouraged that the need is there yeah. and not just to look at government. Okay. Um, and and the third thing is that uh, safety and health is a global movement and uh, the demand for safety and health across the world is still present and uh, that need can only grow. Corona showed that that need can only grow it did not cause the need. It just showed that every enterprise must have investments in OSH and must be led by somebody who has clear knowledge of OSH and that must be an OSH professional. Okay. There was a concern about buses and... Um, yes, uh, about buses, it's true that uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act even recognizes vessels. I'll, I'll inform the audience that indeed some of the... Our, our highest occupational accidents are actually in the transport sector. And if you are a commercial enterprise and a driver gets injured and he is operating on instructions of an employer, it is occupational. So it is not falling outside the, 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 the ambit of the law. Okay. All right, there's another question or concern at the back. Yes, start with your name, sir. Thank you, Tiva. My name is Felix Atik. I am an environmental health and safety practitioner. I'll direct my question to Dr. Nyandus. Now, um, specifically on Weber, uh, the second opinion concept, uh, you find out a case where the doctor, uh, through DOSH, two, DOSH 1 part 2, has given a percentage to an injured employee. Then DOSH, will do the computation and uh, give the figure. Now this figure it will be taken to insurance company for compensation purpose. The insurance company will wait for another three or four months, then they call for a single opinion doctor. So if the employee was awarded 10%, for instance, after four months, the second opinion doctor from the insurance will come with another figure of 7%. That is 3% less than the previous. Now, was it the enactment of the Weber Act of 07, or how did this second concept opinion come into place? Because it's seriously affecting employees. In the span of five months, employee would think of taking another direction, mm. going to the lawyer, and then uh, take the legal process which is not good. Secondly, I want to understand the personal accident at the workplace. Because um, an employee reports to work with a condition that is not related to work. He falls down, he collapses and dies. How do you categorize this kind of accident? Thank you so much. OK. Mm, very interesting questions. Um, Let's take the example of Trevor. He's working in a factory. He gets his foot crushed. And uh, the first primary doctor who takes care of him is probably the doctor who found him with a crushed foot. Puts him on treatment, presumably ends the treatment at a certain point, and determines that the disability is 25%. OK? And uh, this, uh, this worker comes to DOSH, my doctor has given me 25%, and the DOSH officer raises the demand note for the 25%. Um, the employer has paid an insurance company, and the insurance company has its own doctor who requires to see the worker. And uh, in between time zero, and four months, anything can have happened. The injury can have gotten worse, the injury can have gotten better. It's not static unless it's an amputation or a loss of organ. It could have gotten better, it could have gotten worse. The circumstances can vary. And this doctor determines that uh, it is more or it is less, or agrees. 
In times when he agrees, of course, the computation goes on and he's paid. I think um, in recognizing, in DOSH recognizing that sometimes the variations between what the primary doctor has given and what the secondary examiner has given are, have such wide variation, we have put an administrative system where this kind of worker is put through a panel. And we have a, I, I have appointed panels where three doctors will review the same, the same, the same uh, worker who is injured. And it is hoped that when three doctors put their mind together, the disability assessment may be reasonable. And that forms the final assessment. So that's the way it works. But sometimes you may have a contestation from the employer, even then. In instances like that, we actually invite that doctor, who was the insurance doctor, to join the panel of the other three doctors for us to come up with one report so that you can bring the issue to an end. You see, in the end, your interest is really in sorting out the, the worker's problem. So this is the way it works. Remember, the worker has a right to choose the doctor. The law actually gives him the right to choose the doctor who's going to conduct the assessment. And a lot of times, a worker will choose a doctor whom he feels will have a generous hand. You know, it's like a child. How much ice cream should I have? I'll go to mom. Mom is likely to give me more. I'll go to dad, dad might just give me enough. So that's there. So of course, and the employer sometimes, the insurance might get a, doc a, a doctor who errs on the side of giving you what is adequate. So the role of the directorate is to actually be an, ad an arbiter that allows you to actually get a disability that is consistent with what you have. So that's, that's the practice, that's what we do. I hope that sorts out a large part of your problem. In the pre-existing condition. The second, the second part of a pre-existing condition. Um, I think every, every case is actually determined on its own merit. And the contribution of whatever pre-existing condition has on a current status is also put in, 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 in into perspective. Um, understand also that one of the important aspects of the Occupational Safety and Health Act is the issue of occupational medical exams in the sense that you should be able to place this worker in the setting that is the correct setting for him. So, but to answer your question more specifically, obviously if I have a heart attack and I was sitting on a platform and I drop down, if my post-mortem shows that I was suffering a heart attack and I got a massive heart attack, shouldn't that be put as a consideration to the fact of the final report? It should. So um, in Weber, there, there, there are a lot of things that happen, but that's an exceptional circumstance or something that does not happen every day. But in my view, yeah. you would require to actually put that into consideration when you're looking at the overall disability. Okay, we have about six minutes to close. I can squeeze in one more question or comment from the audience. Who, who, oh my God, we have so many of them. This has to be very brief because you're running out of time. Let's start with that. Yes, sir. Start with your name. Thank you. My name is David. Uh, my first request goes to Dr. Nyanduzi. Yeah. Given the response we are just given, that uh, according to the current law, is that uh, the compensation that is done is under the current laws. But then you find that uh, still people are not compensated until families go to court, even after somebody has died. How come that these laws are there, but they are not adequately followed enough to be able to ensure that uh, this Victims are compensated. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's take that question as well so that we just wind up with all of them. Yes, go Thank ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Godfrey Atindi from Zuri Suites, and uh, mine is directed to Dr. Nyandusi also. Yeah. Kindly, sir, can you clarify on this? Uh, there's been rumors 
of some workers eh, just coming up with intentional accidents. Let me call them intentional. So in your career, have you encountered such a case? And how is the employer safeguarded from such? That I'm operating a machine, I just do it intentionally, it cuts me, so that I get that uh, compensation. Then uh, domestic workers, are they safeguarded by DOSH? And also, we have this issue of uh, self-workplace inspections by the employers. And uh, DOSH, you admit you are incapacitated, you don't have enough manpower, so you've you've, uh, you have engaged pro pro practitioners eh, who do this and uh, submit those reports both to the employer and DOSH. So how do you regulate these guys so that you get the real picture on the ground? All Thank right, you. there's a question somewhere here. Pass the microphone to her, but you embellish embellish so that we wind up with the questions once and for all. Bring up the, there's another one there. Yes. Dr. Andrew, go ahead. As you get the microphone to her. Front, here. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Andrew Muruka. This question is headed towards uh, Steve Obiro. Okay. I want to know what FK is doing to bring into its bracket and membership all these workplaces which are called Juakali, okay. so that they are able to benefit from the occupational safety and health services. Thank okay. you. All right, yes, go ahead. Um, my name is uh, Alphonse Matogo. Uh -huh. Mine is to thank the uh, trade union, uh, Madam, for the plans that you have put in place in terms of uh, your manual on safety and health, yeah. but I would wish that you summarize what you have, even if it is just about five things on safety, to be synthesizing them, which will not cost you a lot of money. And then to Daktari, we, we have talked about the social scheme, which will be catering for the Work Injury Benefit Act. I don't know how you have integrated the border borders on this one because they are equally workers and at some level they have forgotten lots. Thank okay. you. Yes, finally here. Yeah. yeah, my name is Mary. I sit in the Nakosh and I represent the National Commission for Science, Technology and Innovation. This is a sector in research and uh, innovation. I think I need to congratulate the directorate. One, uh, from last year, they have been visible. And this is one of the ways that uh, the, you, uh, the, the common, the stakeholders are actually getting to know what DOSH is. I can uh, tell you that uh, previously, the biosafety issues were taken up by other institutions who do not have a mandate. But uh, now, as we are moving on, I think this is a positive move, and uh, the directorate should continue. Uh, with however small it is, but I know it is far-reaching. Let okay. the world know that all the Kenyans know biosafety can be compensated with the, because it is DOSH that has the law yeah. to compensate anybody who gets an occupational disease within the laboratories and even those facilities that carry out research. All Thank right. you. All right. Obiro, let's start with you. You have a few questions. The Juakali inclusion, as you also make your closing remarks, then we'll come to Daphne to give the summary of programs as you make your closing remarks as well. And then we we'll come to Dr. Nyandusi, who has a barrage of questions. <laughs> you have like four of them. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Trevor. Yeah. Uh, for us, three things that we are doing. One is for Juakali sector, one thing they lack is the knowledge of what they need to do. We have a program that we run called Start Improve Your Business that looks at all these issues that we offer to, the, to that uh, sector so that then they can transist and become formal and become more organized and they can belong to the, to the federation. The second thing, we have invested a lot in, uh, in technology and we are giving the employers a platform. If you go to our website, there is the the EYG platform members portal that you can join and register and through that portal being a member of FK you can access um, information that is, is required and so we are calling upon all the employers wherever they are whether you are in the Juakali you are uh, our members 
please come and register so that then you can be able to access the, um, uh, the information that is there. The third thing, we run the master classes. Master classes that are virtual, and one for OSH is coming in July. You can join this class everywhere. It doesn't matter wherever you are, using even your phone. And you are able to access and access the, the trainings that are there. So we are putting together all this infrastructure so that we can help even that uh, sector that is not accessible to get this information. And we work with partnership with other organizations, uh, including the Juakali Federation. And we also encourage our, our formal employers to yeah. include them in the value chains and supply chains. And that way we help them come to the, uh, to the formal sector. Now, my closing remarks, uh, Trevor. The, the responsibility to have safe workplaces is a shared responsibility. All of us have to play our part. As the Federation, as we are playing our part to engage the employers, sensitize them, build their capacity, we want also the other side to take the obligation to know that there is a responsibility to everyone. It should not be just about it is the employer. It is all of us. And I like what uh, Dr. Ari said. It is our country. Yeah. So let's all come out and be able to build a country that we are going to be proud of, the workplaces that we are going to be proud of. Our approach to any issue should not be to destroy a workplace, yeah. but to make it better, to make it stronger, to make it more productive, to make it more safer and uh, for, the, for the worker and more productive in the business it is doing. Okay. That is what our country needs. All right, Thank Nafin. You. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, just to respond on uh, occupational safety and health, basically what we highlight in the, in the manual is what is actually safety and health? What are the risks? What are occupational hazards? You know, what are your obligations? What are your responsibilities? What are your rights within the Act? And of course, and many more. The manual, anybody within Mombasa, anybody in Kenya can access. I am the custodian of that program within the coast region. Nairobi and other uh, counties, we have different people who man that program. Now, my vinyl shots, yes. it's a concern. I would urge our team from FKE. There's, uh, there, there's, there's that challenge of compliance once the department has acted in terms of compensation. If they need to look at that, I think that would really help us. And then we as social partners, what is it that we are thinking yeah. in a situation like now we had corona, we had COVID-19. What is it? How prepared are we in yeah. matters safety and health? Okay. Finally, my uh, friend on the other side, Dr. Ari, what is your power? Where is the enforcement bit? Yeah. What is it? Okay. that we can do to ensure that. What do you, because they do a pretty good job. Yeah. But what is it that we, you know, the department, uh, you know, can be, you know, equipped okay. to ensure that whatever they recommend yeah. is actually complied with. I had an employer who was actually directed by the, by the department to ensure that workers have uniforms. Yeah. But what did he do? He walked to a petrol station and brought some overalls. Yeah. Names, yeah? You know, what is the power of that? And okay. Definitely, as uh, Kotu, we are always available, okay. ready to ensure that. Because our key issue is safety yeah. in the workplace. Okay. Thank you. Friend, and do see over to you now. There's delays in compensation, intentional accidents, how the employer is protected, domestic workers are there under DOSH, and border border inclusion. As you also tell us now, what is the way forward in your closing remarks? Wow. Um, let's start from the beginning. Um, I think I want to start with a comment about approved persons first. At the directorate, because we, we know that uh, we need to extend the reach of the directorate, what we've done is that we've engaged professionals in different fields, qualified, experienced, seasoned professionals. We call them safety, say safety advisors, plant inspectors, you know, every lift, every lifting device, pressurized vessels, boilers in the workplaces, they must be examined for safety, it's preventative uh, examination. We have uh, institutions we've registered to do first aid training, to do OSH training, to do fire training. And of course, we have even doctors whom we, 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 we engage to be able to conduct the medical examination. This actually increases our reach on average by almost five times. So what we are able to do in the department, we actually multiply by five times through these people. These people are agents of the department. They don't become their own agents. 
They are required to submit their reports to the regional office where the, where, where, where the work is done, and another copy comes to us at the headquarters. And the regional officer has a responsibility to make follow-up on the audits that are submitted, the medical exams that are submitted, and also to make follow-up on some of the challenges that have been found. So we do have a lot of control over them, and we do have a discipline mechanism over them where they go out, including the registration. And we renew their, their, their licenses annually, and we can withdraw their license at any time if there is proof of uh, professional misconduct. Um, the second question was the issue of the border border. How can we include them? Yeah. I think that question is actually linked to the second question of formalization of informal workspaces. You cannot separate the border borders and any other informal employer, employee, from the issue of requiring them to actually have a formalization process for you to be able to map their risk matrix and be able to provide for them safety and health services as well as work injury um, services that are appropriate for them in the setting that they are. So the answer again, formalization, formalization, formalization. Let's not forget that even the watchmakers of Switzerland at some point were called informal watchmakers. But today, the Swiss watch is one of the most expensive items anybody will be able to buy, and in an extremely organized industry with a lot of safety practices. Yeah. Does that capture the domestic workers as well? The third issue is the domestic worker. The domestic worker is a worker and is protected by WIBA in the event they get injuries in the course of their work, in case they get diseases in the course of their work, that law does not exempt them. And it is important for us to take note of that fact and be able to do not just about the work injury benefits, but also the occupational safety and health aspects, as well as even the, the, the remuneration aspects in accordance with the wages council that are appropriate for that sector. He, he or she is a worker and is a protected worker by law. Okay. Um, there was the a last one was compensation, delays in compensation. The law is there, but it yes, is forever. I think, for I, think, I, th I think if you are listening carefully to the discussions today, everybody alluded to how acrimonious the process of settlement of claims is. And uh, today it's one of our biggest headaches in the department. Um, of course, we have a large number of employers who still you may find they never actually took an insurance for their, for, their, for their workers. And then it exposes them to be the ones who are actually supposed to pay. They didn't know it. They didn't know, ignorant about it. We do have a few insurers who um, make it extremely difficult for one to get compensation for the same. But my officers are up to the challenge and they do make follow-up. Of course, unfortunately, it can take a very long time. But we are up to the task in terms of following the same. And on the same breath is the reason why we are saying we need to make the process friendlier for the worker, for the employer, and for government. And to keep the oil and grease of enterprise running with as little acrimony as possible. Okay. And your closing remark finally now. My, my closing remarks. Um, first, I would like to thank you, Trevor. Um, it's been an opportunity for us to actually discuss safety and health in an honest setting, in a way that the public uh, knows not just their rights, but also their obligations. Um, of course, um, the issue bring to fore the issues that uh, safety and health is actually a shared responsibility between all the parties. And it's important that even as we realize our rights, that we are also alive to our obligations. I think there is no right that, that exists in absolution. We should also be alive to our obligations and carry our obligations where we are. And uh, for all of us, because all of us are workers in one way or another, whether it's in your house, in your farm, or wherever you are, is that you need to constantly be asking yourself, am I safe? And ensure that you actually take all necessary steps to ensure that you are safe. The government is not going to be everywhere to ensure that everything you are doing is done safely. Of course, legislation exists to protect workers, but the primary responsibility to ensure safety lies with ourselves. And I would like to ask us all to keep in mind um, this week as a week for safety and health 
and uh, sensitize one another about it and uh, put in mind and uh, <coughs> um, sorry, sorry and uh, reflect on the workers who got injured or who unfortunately died in the course of their work and of course commit yourself that you should not be a similar statistic all right thank you thank you so much for making time this evening dr musa nyandus to the secretary of occupational safety and health at the ministry of labor they are abbreviated as dosh <coughs> Stephen obiro head of advocacy consulting and partnership at federation of kenya of employers and afin munde trustee and branch secretary kipao which is kenya plantation and agricultural workers union court thank you so much for making time and thank you all for, for taking part into this conversation. We extended it a bit because it's important. We know either you're a worker or an employer or both, or you know someone who's a worker or an employer, so your safety starts with you. Like Dr. Andrew had mentioned earlier on, that 98% of all the accidents are avoided, except just 2%, which are acts of God. So it means safety starts with you. A special thanks also to the Sarova White Sands right here in County 001 Mombasa fantastic and scenic views and fantastic facilities as well and thank you so much for hosting all of us here tonight on the Monday report right from county 001 heading back to county number 47 my name is Trevor BJ it's always a pleasure having you with us let's do this again same time maybe different place we could be in your county next all right good night for now